In my role as Board Game Geek News Guy, sometimes I forget how early I get to see games in the production process. I'll see designers showing prototypes to publishers at various conventions. I'll see a pre-production copy of something at a different convention. I will get an advanced copy of a game to do a write-up on BGG News or do a preview video, kind of like this one. I'll play the game multiple times. I'll do the video. I've done, everything's written up. It's on the previews. And then it comes out, and I feel like I'm done with it. I feel like I'm on to the next thing. It's, it's a little weird sometimes sort of working in the future that way, and yet the market is kind of moving in that direction as well, with more and more publishers bringing games to conventions early and selling copies to create buzz about something before it's actually out. It's not a new thing, but it seems to be more common with greater numbers of quantities of games hitting the market earlier. So I, I'm here talking about Reef a design by Emerson Matsuuchi and Next Move Games that Next Move brought to Origins 2018 in June, sold several hundred copies. They brought it to Gen Con in early August, sold copies, and now the game is actually hitting the retail market at the end of September 2018. So this game has been seeded throughout multiple conventions and then travels around, other people get their hands on it, people get to try it out early, and now it actually is available to most people who may or may not know anything about the game. They just, they'll see the box, they'll flip it over, they'll get the one, two, three short overview of how the game works, and they'll be like, oh, okay, I heard so-and-so talk about this game. Maybe I will pick up this game too. So now, just in case you know nothing about Reef, I will tell you about it as well. Here are the components in Reef. As is befitting the name, we have four types of coral with which we will build reefs on our individual player boards. So each player gets a board. You start by placing one piece of coral of each color on those boards, and you will be building up structures to score points. Keep track of these points on these point markers, and you will be scoring points based upon how well you match the conditions on these cards. You start with a display of three cards, a face-up deck, and two cards in hand. Turns and Reef are straightforward. You either pick up one of the face-up cards that's on display, paying a point if you want the card off the top of the deck, getting any of the other three for free, and you add that card to your hand. Alternatively, you play a card in your hand, and you collect the coral pieces that are shown on top, and then score for the condition that's shown on the bottom. The primary challenge of Reef is twofold. When you play a card, you get two pieces of coral to add to your reef. However, those colors are not present in the scoring condition that will happen after you place the coral. So assuming I picked up this card earlier, I play it now, I get two pieces of green coral that I want to place somewhere in my reef. You can build on top of pieces that already exist up to a height of four, and now this is considered a green piece of coral of height two because the green piece is on top. Doesn't matter what's underneath anymore. And now, because I have left the yellow and purple alone, I will score three points because I have one instance of yellow and purple being adjacent, no matter what height they are because the height's not specified here. So I take a three point token. On my next turn, perhaps I want to play this card. I'll add purple and orange. And I wanna set up certain things. So I can do purple here. Maybe I'll go ahead and do orange here. And now, you know, for every piece of reef that I have that's at exactly too high, I'll score one point. So four points for me. So you're trying to build upon the cards and make one card chain into another to score. Next turn, maybe I want to play this one. I got two yellow to play. Hmm, I can do, well, let's see. What can I do that's going to be meaningful? because right now I have nothing else to go on. I know I want these two to score. I need diagonally adjacent, purple and green, at least two high. I'll score five points for these, but I don't want to mess with anything else. So maybe I don't want this yet. Maybe I want to take something else that's going to be meaningful. Maybe I want to build for the future and know what I will be getting into. Maybe I want to draft this card into my hand instead so I know that if I play this card next and place two yellow and place two yellow here, then I can play this card and be able to get five points for that purple and yellow. Hmm, but I'm placing two orange. How am I gonna score for orange? Right now there's no meaningful orange cards. Oh, there's one on the top here. 
So maybe I want to plan ahead and draft that as well. To get this card on top, I have to take a one point token and put it on a card with the lowest point value. Okay, so now I can draft this and put it in my hand. Okay, I'm going to plan ahead. I'm going to play this one, get two yellow, which I did here, and score five points. Got it. And then next turn, I can place two orange. Oh, and I want to scatter my orange around so that I can score more points for this. Okay. And I'll get five points for this one. And now I've got this, where I can score three points, but I'm going to place two green. But what is meaningful with green here? Almost nothing. Here is just anything of height two. Here you take your highest green and look for each orange around it. Oh, I'm definitely going to go ahead and take this one. Yes. And then we continue. So it's a constant flow of cards into and out of your hand, trying to chain things together in order to build up valuable reefs. This brings us to the second difficulty that comes about when playing reef, the existence of other humans. Once you pick up a card, no one can stop you from playing that card, taking the coral, adding the coral to the board, and scoring it in whatever manner you like. You have your own board and no one can mess with that. However, maybe you will not be able to get that card. Other people are going to see what you're building on your board, and if they are paying attention to you, which happens mostly in a two-player game, they can definitely stop you. When I look at the cards here, I have my two cards in hand and I see the display. I'm looking ahead to see what I can combo together with what I already have in hand. I've got this green one that's going to score for the orange around here. This one can score for orange and give me more green. I look ahead, oh, yellow next to each other, which could give me more orange. That's cool. However, which order am I going to play them in? I would have to play these yellow in order to score this, but I want to play the orange before I score this. So each one depends on the other, and yet I can't chain them together the way I might want. What about something else? I have this one here, which I could take hmm, and plan ahead possibly for this one as well. If I think ahead, this one comes out. If I think ahead here, well, maybe next turn I can play yellow and green here. And then I score for each matching set of two that's next to one another. You score each combination only once. So I can't score for this two and this two and this two and this two and this two. This two. No. So I can score this, this, this for six points. And then this card goes away. I could do that. And now I'm setting up ooh, for this one as well. Now I'll draft this next time. Play this for five points. Get more orange. Play this as well for ten points. For orange around green, da, 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 five points for this, and on and on and on. But as people see what I'm building, maybe I don't even get to take these cards. Because at this point in the game, someone can look ahead and see that if I get this card, I'm scoring six points for it, based on what I already have on the board. So someone else can draft it instead. And then I'm left with these options that were available. Mm which has this, uh, purple with yellow around it, I get two points. This is nothing. This, I have no purple. I have no purple in my hand. This scores purple as well. These are all worthless to me. So if other people are paying attention to what I am trying to do, then they can take something that will hopefully be worth something for them and possibly stop me along the way. I played Reef eight times now, several times on a pre-production copy, as I alluded to at the beginning of this video, and multiple times on a finished production copy that was given to me for review by Next Move Games and Matsuuchi. So I've played with all player counts, two, three, four, and I find that two really hammers in that competition between players because you can more easily pay attention to what other people are doing. With four players, it's hard to keep track of everyone, at least initially, because you know, they're doing their own things. I'm kind of focused just on what I'm doing. Right? I, I can only care so much about what someone else is doing and I'm not going to take something to block someone if it's not really going to help me. So other, another player will end up with a card that they really can score tons of points with just because no one wants to fall in that grenade. With two players though, you can pay much more attention to that other player and that hate drafting makes sense because 
you can see what they're doing and you can more easily respond to that. You can pay more attention to the flow of cards in general, which means you're paying attention to the flow of colors in the game. Which colors of coral are most prevalent on the cards that are being drafted by the players? Okay, that's going to be important because then you want to pay attention to what scoring opportunities are coming about. And if I can see that purple is just not happening at all, and I can grab the card or the one or two cards that come up that give purple, that means I can take advantage of those scoring cards that appear and my opponent can't. So you want to leave yourself open to be able to take cards because again, you have a four card limit and you wanna keep them from doing it. You wanna keep them from getting the cards that will give them a ton of points. Maybe you'll only score four points off of something, but if you can keep them from scoring 10, it could be worth it for you to take a turn and draft it, keep it away from them. And that's kind of funny because in a way that mirrors my experience with Azul, which is the first title in the next move line. It was originally published by plan B and then moved to next, next move when that line came into existence. Now this is a game by Michael Kiesling, it's two to four players, it's a drafting game, not like Reef at all, but you're drafting tiles and putting them on the board and trying to score. And the thing is you have to draft something in that game and playing with two players, you have much greater control over what the other player is going to have available to them at different times during the game. So Reef works similarly in that regard in that you have that correspondence you have that ability to affect the other player more where with more players in the game you're just you're going to do your own thing you're going to focus on that that puzzly aspect of drafting the things that work best for you there's one advantage of having more players in the game is that the cards flow through more quickly you don't get stuck in that color bind where no one wants you know if you're in a two players and a color is not appearing, and that color is what's scoring on the bottom of all the cards, no one wants to take those because they're worthless. So you just kind of focus on what you're doing and there's, it, it stagnates just with the, the color pool there. That's of course where you try to take advantage of that and draft the things that will give you a slight edge on that. With four players, the cards are flying around much more freely and you just do the best you can with what's available to you, you know, at that particular time because the three cards that are out on your current turn could all be gone by your next turn. So you don't, you have less control over what you're getting, which can be good or bad, eh, depending on the type of player you are. The game continues with players drafting cards and playing them, taking the coral, adding at scoring points until one of the colors runs out completely. And at that point you finish the round so that everyone has had the same number of turns and then you'll score for the cards left in hand. And this brings up a real timing issue that you have to pay attention to as the game nears its end. I look at the cards in hand, the cards available here. None of these are going to use up the orange coral, but have I tracked what other people have taken? Am I aware of, of when the game can possibly end? You have, you have more ability to do this in a two player game because I know, well, if the opponent takes two, I'm still going to get another turn after that, but once you add a third or fourth player, it's a little less out of your control. I could play this card right now and score 10 points for my two stacks of four that have a green on top, place this on the board, and then hmm, hopefully I can score for the, I can draft this next time. But if someone ends the game, I'm left only with this card in hand and I'll get six points. Hmm, if I draft this ahead of time, before placing this, now I'll have this card in hand, and hopefully I can put together these multiple turns where I'll play this, do this, score this, get more green, build up towards another square. Oh, maybe I want to draft this one as well, because if I can place three more green on the board, then I can score this twice for 12 points. Or is the game going to end? Would it make more sense to draft this instead so I can at least score four points for my already existing green L shape. Those are the choices as you're rushing towards the end of the game. And there's an overview of Reef, which continues the design aesthetic of Azul, both in terms of gameplay and components. That's not by accident, mind you. I mean, both games are for two to four players. They're lightly themed, fairly abstract games. You wouldn't have to build reefs for Reef to make sense. It could be anything. It could be 
called piles. It could be buildings. Uh, it could be something else that I'm not sure what you want to do. It's cakes rising in the oven. It can be all types of different things, but giving that, that thematic hook to it of coral reefs gives you something to hold on to and sort of frame the action around as you're playing the game. And it also allows you to work with pieces that tell stories on their own. These nice, beautiful plastic pieces. In terms of the components, yes, that's what you have. You have this, these components that you don't necessarily need to play the game, but they make you pay attention to the game. I saw this when I was at Spiel 2017, outside the big Plan B booth, giant booth, lots of demo tables, tons of people playing Azul, and even more people watching people play Azul. The game caught a lot of eyes, and people would come over to look at it just because the game was beautiful. It looked great on the table, very attractive, and people want to see it. This is something publishers should pay attention to. I understand, of course, you have different segments of the audience that you want to appeal to, and maybe you don't want to appeal to that audience of so people who like beautiful games. I'm not, I'm not sure if you qualify as one of those publishers. It's not something you'll advertise, of course, but price is not the only thing that people care about when they are looking at games. Azul cost, it has an MSRP of $40. Reef's the same thing. If you had plastic components or cardboard components, you could get it down to 30, possibly even 25. But the game would not attract the attention that it does with the components that it has. Whether that's good or not, I'll leave that up to you. Maybe you think people talk about it too much. You care only about the gameplay. I prefer to play with pieces of paper that are cut out and you can draw on them and I don't care. That's fine, but that's not most people. I've seen other publishers, other mainstream publishers release abstract or themed abstract games that just have cardboard components. And a lot of them are just like, they're not talked about, they're not photographed, they're not seen. Azul and Reef give you reasons to post photos of those games. These are Instagram games, right? Going for this audience of, of people who share images and things of beauty and other people look at that and say, oh, I want that too. I may not know anything about the way it plays, but I look at it and I want, it, I want, I want to play that game. And then add something to the game itself as you're playing with these wonderful pieces. You sort of you know, sift your hands through it and feel it. And it just sounds great uh, when you're rubbing them in front of the microphone. I'll just mention that. Or at other times. And it just gives you another aspect. It's not just the pleasure of the gameplay, but it's the pleasure of the aesthetic experience as well. And you merge those together and they reinforce each other. That's not a bad thing for publishers to try to achieve. So maybe some of them will do this seeing more of the success of Azul, and we'll see how Reef does as well. It's got some time still to prove itself.